I remember when I wanted to record this video and legit my PC broke down and I had explained almost half of the information only for my PC to automatically shut off. That's how I put out everything and I was like, I'll do this video another day. So I got a request from someone on the channel that please make sure that the next video that you do on your channel is Neonato Jaundice. And I thought maybe this is a very important topic to actually do such that you guys can have a proper understanding of how to tackle this topic. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at neonatal jaundice. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to receive notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So before I actually go into much, much details, remember that jaundice comes from the word yawn which is a French word meaning yellow. So this is simply put, yellowish discoloration of the mucous membranes and the skin that's going to be as a result of increase in bilirubin levels. Remember that these increase in the bilirubin levels may either be as a result of conjugated bilirubin, which is bound to glucuronic acid, and unconjugated bilirubin, which is not bound to glucuronic acid. Remember that this is going to be occurring during the first week of life and is frequently caused by the unconjugated, which is also referred to as the indirect hyperbilirubinemia. This is what we refer to as a physiological type of jaundice. About 50 to 60% of the newborns uh, are going to be clinically jaundiced in the first week of life. And the grandmothers know this. They'll tell you that no, if the child is yellow, put them under the sun. They know this because the bulk majority of the children, normal newborn babies, are going to be jaundiced. It's physiological. You don't do much about it. So... It becomes visible and occurs in the neonate when the serum levels actually exceed 5 milligrams per deciliter. That's roughly about 85 micromoles per liter. And remember to convert from the milligrams per deciliter to micromoles per liter, you multiply by a conversion factor of 17.1. Remember that neonatal jaundice is quite important because it's going to be a sign of an underlying disease. It can be a sign of a hemolytic anemia. It could be a sign of an infection. It could be a sign of a metabolic disease. It could be a sign of a liver disease. And in the case of unconjugated bilirubin, remember it's water soluble. So it can cross the blood brain barrier, which is not so well formed in the young children. So this can actually result in deposits in the brain, particularly in the basal ganglia. And this may lead to a condition that's known as connectorous, or what we refer to as a bilirubin encephalopathy, where they have in long term, they may develop a chorioathetoid type of cerebral palsy. And remember, this can also result in deposits in the auditory nucleus, and this may lead to deafness. Now, let's talk a little bit about the metabolism of bilirubin. Where exactly is this bilirubin coming from? Remember, giving your background, you have red blood cells in your body that are going to be consisting of a protein that's known as hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin is going to be consisting of two large main parts. It's going to be consisting of a protein, the globulin part, which are going to be four chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains if you're talking about adult hemoglobin. And if you're talking about fetal hemoglobin, two alpha chains and two gamma chains. Then you also have a heme part, which has a protoporphyrin ring as well as an ion molecule right at the center. So after the red blood cells have lived their life, they're supposed to be hemolyzed in the spleen and eventually the breakdown of the, the, those pigments and the protoporphyrin rings is what gives rise to this bilirubin. So remember that bilirubin is as a result of hemolysis of the red blood cells and the red blood cells have a pigment which is known as hemoglobin, like I said, which has a heme and it also has a globin part, which are the amino acids. The heme is going to be consisting of iron and a protoporphyrin ring. Remember, after about 120 days in infants, they live for about 70 days, they are going to be broken down in the reticular endothelial system by the spleen, the macrophages of the spleen. Recall that the spleen is going to be consisting of the red pulp and the white pulp. So when the hemoglobin is actually broken down, it's going to be split into a heme part and it's going to be split into a globin part. The globin part is predominantly going to be broken down into amino acids that are going to be recycled and to make other proteins, to even make hemoglobin and um, other plasma proteins and other proteins that are needed in the body. 
the heme part is going to be broken down by an enzyme that's known as heme oxygenase into a, a, a closed tetrapyloric ring which contains iron, which is referred to as oxyheme. So heme is going to be converted to oxyheme. The enzyme that catalyzes this is known as heme oxygenase. Then the oxyheme is going to be further converted by another enzyme that's known as heme reductase into biliverdin. Remember, biliverdin is now an open tetrapyloric ring that doesn't have ion. So the ion actually has been removed at this particular stage. The ion that has been removed is going to be binding to a certain transport protein that's known as transferrin. How I'd like to remember it is remember transferrin is a protein that transfers ion to the storage sites. So this transferrin is going to be transporting the ion to the liver where it's going to be stored. And remember, ion can be stored in two large forms in the body. It could deposit in the tissue and form hemosiderin that ion is pretty much lost. It can't be recycled. Or it could be stored as it's bound to a certain protein that's known as ferritin. So that is the storage, the, the main storage form of iron. It's going to be bound to ferritin. Then this biliverdin that remained is going to be converted to bilirubin by an enzyme that's known as biliverdin reductase. But remember this bilirubin that you have formed is unconjugated bilirubin. This is indirect bilirubin. In essence, it is water insoluble. This doesn't dissolve so well in water, but it's lipid soluble. So it means that this bilirubin has to be bound to something else in order to make it more water soluble so that you can actually excrete it into the urine, you can excrete it into the stool. So remember that bilirubin is very toxic uh, and it's quite toxic to the tissue. So it has to be transported to the liver where it's is going to be made more water soluble so it can be excreted. And as it's being transported to the liver, it's going to be bound to albumin and pre-albumin in the bloodstream. But still, this is unconjugated bilirubin. Then once the bilirubin reaches the hepatocytes, it's going to be taken up at the sinusoidal surfaces and this uptake is actually quite rapid. Now you would ask me this. The bilirubin is lipid soluble, so it means it can easily cross into the hepatocytes. And what, why then doesn't it go back into the bloodstream? Why does it keep flowing into the hepatocytes? There are other proteins that are very important for you to remember. The other proteins that are present in the hepatocytes are known as the ligandins and the Z proteins. You can think of these proteins as the proteins that trap the bilirubin within the hepatocytes. So remember that the ligandins are these group of enzymes that represents 2% of the cytosolic proteins and the Z proteins are pretty much going to be binding to the fatty acids. So the primary function of these proteins is to prevent that um, reflux of the free bilirubin back into the bloodstream because the time lapse between the uptake of bilirubin and conjugation takes quite some time and keep this in mind. Then the ligandin concentrations are generally low at birth in, in newborn babies, especially in the premature babies, and the, but they rapidly increase over a few weeks. There is a drug that's known as phenobarbitone that can actually be given to induce these um, certain enzymes that we we'll talk about in the metabolism of bilirubin that we can actually potentially use in certain scenarios. Then remember that these ligandin concentrations may be increased, like I said, by the administration of this pharmacological agent, such as phenobarbital, which can actually help in certain cases. Then remember that once we're now in the hepatocytes, we have this unconjugated bilirubin or this indirect bilirubin that is present within the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. It undergoes a process that's known as conjugation. Remember that the process of conjugation makes the bilirubin from it, it being water insoluble to it being more water soluble. So this process of conjugation is going to now result to the addition of glucuronic acid, two moieties of glucuronic acid. And now the unconjugated bilirubin is going to be converted to conjugated bilirubin or what we refer to as direct bilirubin. It's also referred um, to as conjugated bilirubin. The enzyme that is important for this process of glucuronidation is known as glucuronyl S transferase. Then remember that the conjugated bilirubin is then going to be secreted into the bile, which is then going to be stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. Remember that the bile is going to be very important for the emulsification of fat. And emulsification is going to be this process where you convert these large fat insoluble globules into small fat droplets, thereby increasing the surface area for fat metabolism and the fat digestion. So remember that bowel is going to be secreted in the first part of the duodenum from the common bowel duct. Now to give you a bit of some anatomy and some perspective, remember that the from the gallbladder, you have a tube that's draining from the gallbladder that's known as the cystic duct. 
the cystic duct is going to be joining uh, another tube that's coming from the liver. Remember that the liver generally has two main sites. The liver is generally going to be having the left lobe and the right lobe. So there's going to be, of course, the right and left hepatic duct. These right and left hepatic ducts are going to fuse to form what is known as the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct is eventually going to meet with the common bowel duct, um, or rather the cystic duct to form the common bowel duct. And this is eventually going to drain into the first part of the duodenum at uh, the ampulla ovata, which is guarded by a sphincter, which is known as the sphincter of OD. Remember, all this is under the control of certain hormones like cholecystokinin that is produced from the GIT. Remember that in the intestines, once now this bilirubin has been secreted into the intestines, it's going to be deconjugated by a bacteria or intestinal enzymes that are going to be uh, having the enzyme beta glucuronidase, which is going to now result in this free bilirubin. Remember, this unconjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble, so it can go back into the bloodstream. So some of the bilirubin is going to be converted by bacterial dehydrogenase into urobilinogen, which is a colorless substance. And once this urobilinogen is actually um, exposed to air, it's going to be converted into urobilin. But the bulk majority of the urobilinogen, the bilirubin and the urobilin is going to be converted um, to stecobilinogen. And then the stecobilinogen, when exposed to air, is going to be converted to stecobilin. This is what gives the feces their characteristic yellow color, such that if there is an obstruction at any level that's preventing bowel from reaching the stool, it means that the stool will lack this characteristic yellow color. So that's why we see that in obstructive jaundice, generally people have this pale stool. Then you also have small amounts of bilirubin and urobilinogen that get absorbed back into the bloodstream. And once they are reabsorbed into the bloodstream, it's going to be excreted into the urine and you excrete about four milligrams per day of urobilinogen into the urine. Then urobilinogen is going to be converted to urobilin and this is going to give the urine the characteristic uh, orange-yellow pigment. And this is by an enzyme that's known as a dehydrogenase enzyme. So how do we classify neonatal jaundice? It may be classified as physiological versus non-physiological. It may be classified as direct versus indirect hyperbilirubinemia. It may be classified as prehepatic versus intrahepatic and also versus posthepatic. These are the three main classifications that I want you to keep in mind because these help you to classify neonatal jaundice and it helps you to work out certain causes that may be there. The most important is of course the third, the prehepatic, intrahepatic and posthepatic. So let's begin and talk a little bit about physiological jaundice. Remember that this is benign and is rather self-limiting type of hyperbilirubinemia, which is of indirect type. So this is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It's going to be occurring at the end of the first week and it doesn't require any treatment. So generally, the visible jaundice that usually appears between 24 to 72 hours of age, that's greater than usually 36 hours after birth. Remember, if a child is born and within 24 hours of this child being born, they become jaundiced, it is never going to be considered physiological. It's considered pathological. So jaundice that is occurring within the first 24 hours, it's going to be considered as pathological. Then it's going to be increasing in severity until day three to four in term infants and day five to seven in preterm infants. Then gradually it's going to fall, then it's going to disappear. Then by day 10 in preterm infants and it will disappear around by day 21 in day 10 in term infants and 21 in preterm infants. Then it's usually, the peak is less than 275 micromoles per liter, and it doesn't rise so quickly. Remember that in physiological jaundice, the unconjugated bilirubin is the one that's going to be elevated. So if you do your, your total bilirubin, you do your serum, your unconjugated bilirubin, and you do your direct bilirubin, and you realize that it's the unconjugated that is risen, and this child is falling in the bracket of physiological jaundice, it's most likely physiological jaundice. So remember that over 50% of the newborns are going to be visibly jaundiced because of certain reasons. These are the reasons what, which are kind of like the mechanisms that are postulated as to explain why certain infants are going to be jaundiced, like 50 to 60% of the infants. Remember that number one, generally, these infants that are in the uterus are in a relatively hypoxic environment. And remember, because of this relative hypoxic environment, they're going to produce a lot of erythropoietin. There's going to be a lot of red blood cell synthesis. So generally, when a child is born, they are born with a higher concentration of HB. They are born with a higher red cell mass. And this extra red cell mass has to be broken down at birth because they are now born into an environment where there's much more oxygen than the uterus, which is a relatively hypoxic environment. So this increases the production of bilirubin as this extra mass of red blood cells are being broken down. 
Then remember that also that the red cell uh, span of the newborn is much shorter than an adult. And the newborn is about 70 to 80 days and in adults it's around 120 days. So the turnover is much faster in the newborn than it is in the adult population. In addition to this, remember that those conjugating enzymes that I stressed to talk about in the very early bits of this lecture are not so well developed. So the liver may be immature, the conjugation systems may be immature, there may be delay in the activity of the hepatic enzymes like glucuronyl transferase, there may be low concentrations of the binding proteins in the, the ligandins in the hepatocytes and this may contribute to a child being visibly jaundiced and it may be physiological. Of course, there is also an increase in the enterohepatic hepatic circulation due to a sterile gut. There is a high intestinal beta-glucuronic levels with decreased intestinal motility. Now what I described is the anatomy I described from how the bowel comes from the liver, it ends up into the gallbladder, it ends up into the intestines and back into the bloodstream. You refer to that circulation as the enterohepatic circulation. So if there's a decrease in motility, it means that there's going to be the materials remaining longer in the gut. There's a higher chance that most of the bilirubin will be reabsorbed. It circulates in the system. It can easily deposit in the mucous membranes and in the skin. And then clinical features of physiological jaundice are going to include, of course, jaundice, which is yellowing of the eyes, yellowing of the skin. It's quite very difficult to see in the neonates especially, but you can see it on the palms of the hands. You can see it in the mouth. You can see it in the eyes, but tend to press on the skin of the child for a few seconds and let go. Then you'll be able to see if the child is jaundiced or not. And then, of course, they will have elevated levels of unconjugated bilirubin. And remember that the peak serum concentration in the normal full-term infant is going to be less than 275 micromoles per liter at around three or four days of life. And then in preterm infants, the peak is going to be reached after five to seven days and it may take about 10, 20, 10 to 20 days before decreasing. Remember that physiological jaundice is a diagnosis of exclusion. Therefore, any baby that is jaundiced must be carefully evaluated to rule out any pathology that may actually be present. Now, I want to talk a little bit about two important things that I want you to keep in mind. There's something that's known as breastfeeding jaundice and there's something that's known as breast milk jaundice. People tend to confuse these things quite a lot. So here's something that I wrote to actually help you remember. So breastfeeding jaundice is because of the breastfeeding. This child is poorly breastfeeding. Then breast milk jaundice is because of the milk itself. There's a component in the milk. So when it comes to breastfeeding jaundice, there's a problem with the feeding. And this actually decreases the intake of milk. It increases the enterohepatic circulation. There is sometimes some dehydration. It's increased circulation of that bilirubin. There's a lot of deposit of the bilirubin. The child becomes jaundiced. Then with the breast milk jaundice, remember that this is going to be diagnosed in someone in a child that's clinically well. They are breastfeeding, but this child remains jaundiced for several weeks following the physiological jaundice. It's often due to the breast milk. The mechanism is not well known, but what we think is the problem is it's going to be due to the breast milk glucuronidase, which leads to an increase in the absorption of unconjugated bilirubin in the enterohepatic circulation. Because the milk has this glucuronidase, it can deconjugate the milk in the gut, the bilirubin in the gut, and it can be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. So remember, this also is a diagnosis of exclusion and breastfeeding should continue. You don't advise the mother to stop breastfeeding. Breastfeeding must continue. Then we move now to the pathological type of jaundice because we've already covered physiological type of jaundice. No need for treatment. But now remember, any child that comes in and they're jaundiced, you want to investigate them fully. Remember that this is jaundice that's going to be secondary to a pathophysiological cause and it may be classified as follows. It may be due to... Uh, unconjugated type of bilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia, you call this as indirect hyperbilirubinemia, where you have an elevation of the bilirubin in which the conjugated component is less than 20% of the total bilirubin. So if you calculate the ratios and you find out that the conjugated bilirubin or the direct bilirubin is less than 20% of the total, then it's most likely an indirect hyperbilirubinemia. If it is greater than 20% of the total, then it's going to be a direct hyperbilirubinemia. Remember, if a child has, a neonate has direct hyperbilirubinemia, it is almost always pathological in the neonates. There is almost always a problem. So remember that there is no clear-cut demarcation between pathological and physiological jaundice. The line is very thin, which is why you must investigate every child. The total serum bilirubin, or TSB, generally have an arbitrary definition 
uh, as pathological um, or defined as pathological if it's exceeding 5 milligrams per deciliter on the first day, 10 milligrams per deciliter on the second day, and 15 milligrams per deciliter thereafter in term infants. So if the child at any times exceeds these thresholds, then they're going to be considered as having a, a pathology being present. Remember, if the jaundice appears on the first day, even in preterm infants, it's going to be considered as pathological jaundice and it needs intervention. Then the same applies if this jaundice persists beyond the usual periods, it's going to require the investigations, it's going to require treatment. Remember that early jaundice is generally going to be secondary to hemolysis, although it may be secondary to infections, extensive bruising, concealed hemorrhage. Because remember, there are some trauma that can happen during birth. A child can develop a cephalohematoma, a child can develop a caput succedaneum. You should be able to distinguish between a cephalohematoma and a caput succedaneum. Remember that the hemolysis may be secondary to antibodies or a defect in the red blood cell structure or the defect in the enzymes. So if the hemolysis is due to a, a problem, a defect in the structure of the red blood cells, we call those largely as membranopathies because they're affected in the membrane. If the pathology is because of a defect in the enzymes, we refer to those as enzymopathy. They're affecting the enzymes. If the pathology or the hemolysis is due to the problem in the hemoglobin that is present in the red blood cell, we call those as hemoglobinopathies. So largely we can have the enzymopathies, hemoglobinopathies, as well as the membranopathies. Remember that early jaundice that is secondary to hemolysis from incompatible blood like RH isoimmunization is actually a major cause of hemolytic jaundice, although the incidence is declining as we're giving mothers anti-D prophylaxis, those that are recess negative from the labor ward. Remember that jaundice that is secondary to ABO isoimmunization is not so severe enough to require an exchange transfusion, but the other blood groups uh, with isoimmunization can also produce a neonatal jaundice. I will do a video of an isoimmunization separate, it's a separate topic on the channel, so don't worry about that. So remember that the defects of the red blood cells, which are the membranopathies, could be things like hereditary spherocytosis, hereditary elliptocytosis, where the cells are spherical and the or they may be elliptic. This is because of certain structural proteins that are missing or defective in the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell. Sometimes it could be some enzymes that are missing, such as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency or pyruvate kinase dehydrogenase, or pyruvate kinase deficiency rather. So these are not so common, but they are important uh, when you have no obvious cause, you should actually check for these uh, causes of hemolysis. Now here's a distinction between physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice. Remember, pathological, any child that's jaundice less than 24 hours of birth with physiological usually tends to occur after 36 hours. The duration of jaundice, which is physiological, is less than 10 days in a term infants, less than 21 days in a preterm infants. But if it's pathological, it would be more than 10 to 14 days in a term infant, it would be more than 21 days in a preterm infant. The peak the total serum bilirubin after birth is usually on day three in term infants with physiological jaundice, day five to seven in preterm infants, and it's usually either early or late in pathological jaundice. And the peak TSB in physiological jaundice is less than 275 micromoles per liter, but in pathological is greater than 272. And generally the rise in TSB per six hours is greater than 50 micromoles if it's pathological. Generally with conjugated serum bilirubin, it only uh, the unconjugated fraction increases in physiological, but it may be greater than 34 micromoles per liter in pathological jaundice. Remember that there is no evidence of hemolysis in physiological. There may or may not be evidence of hemolysis in pathological jaundice. There is no underlying illness in physiological jaundice. There may or may not be an underlying illness in pathological jaundice by not be meaning that you may have investigated and it may have yielded you nothing. But that doesn't mean that the child doesn't have an underlying pathology. In physiological jaundice, generally there is no hepatomegaly, there is no pale or dark stool. You may have this in pathological jaundice. So what are the causes of the two main types of jaundice? Remember, well, we've grouped it into indirect, or this is referred to as unconjugated, and then you have conjugated. Unconjugated, it means that there is a problem that is uh, affecting the red blood cells. Either the liver is being overwhelmed because you're producing a lot of bilirubin for it to actually conjugate, or there are some defects in the liver that are affecting the conjugation system such that you get accumulation of a lot of indirect or unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So these causes could be physiological jaundice, which we've talked about. They could be due to an increase in the red blood cell load, which could be due to a 
Kefalo hematoma, a caput succedaneum, it could be due to birth trauma. Please comment in the section below about a caput succedaneum so that I know that you're following and interacting with these videos, the difference between caput succedaneum and a kefalo hematoma. Then it may be due to excessive bilirubin production from hemolysis, like I said, the membranopathies like hereditary spherocytosis, hereditary elliptocytosis, enzymopathies like pyruvate kinase deficiency, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. There could be an due to antibodies and ABORH incompatibility. Then it could be a defect in the conjugation of the bilirubin by the liver. There are certain conditions like crigler najjar syndrome, which is due to a deficiency in the glucuronyl transferase enzyme. And remember, there are two types. You have type 1, which is very severe and generally affects individuals and they can die within childhood because of the connectorus, the deposits of this bilirubin in the brainstem, deposits of this bilirubin in the basal ganglia, in the auditory nuclei. This one here, they have an absolute deficiency of glucuronyl transferase. Then Krigler-Najjar type 2 is a less severe type of condition where there's a relative deficiency of this glucuronyl S transferase. You also have Gilbert syndrome. Then you may have breastfeeding jaundice, which we talked about, and typically this is going to be during the first week of life with increase in the bilirubin levels, and it's usually related to suboptimal milk intake or poor feeding. So this poor intake leads to weight loss, there may be dehydration, there may be decrease in the passage of stool, and all these things are going to be decreasing the excretion of bilirubin in the stool, such that more bilirubin is now going to be circulating in the system. And it may be due to breast milk jaundice, which consists of the enzyme. This is also typically after the first week of life and is going to be related to the breast milk having high levels of beta glucuronidase and high uh, lipase content. So remember that the elevated bilirubin is highest in the second and the third weeks of life. Uh, and the lower levels of bilirubin may persist until 10 weeks of life. Then you may also sometimes have... In inborn errors of metabolism such as hypothyroidism and sometimes it may be due to upper GI obstructions that may increase enterohepatic recirculation like pyloric stenosis, duodenal stenosis and annular pancreas. Causes of direct hyperbilirubinemia, remember that this is going to be causing conjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia. So this may be due to obstruction of the hepatobiliary tree, that may be due to a cholidocal cyst, it may be due to obstruction that is secondary to biliary atresia. It may be due to a neonatal infection such as a sepsis. It may be due to a neonatal hepatitis like hepatitis A, B, C. It may be due to Epstein-Barr virus, torch infections, varicella, herpes, and tuberculosis. It may be, remember that the torch stands for toxoplasmosis. The O is for others like syphilis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus. And others even have added HIV to that list. It may be due to cystic fibrosis. It may be due to cholestasis that's associated with parenteral nutrition. It may be due to some metabolic disorders such as galactosemia. It may be due to other things like hereditary fructose intolerance. It may be due to tyrosinemia. It may also be due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So how do we evaluate hyperbilirubinemia? Remember that generally jaundice should be evaluated under the following circumstances. Number one, if it's appearing less than 24 hours of age, remember that's considered as pathological. Number two, if the rise is greater than 5 to 8 milligrams per deciliter in a 24-hour period, that's going to be considered as pathological. Number two, if the rate of the rise of the bilirubin exceeds 0 0.5 milligrams per deciliter per hour, this is going to be suggestive of hemolysis. You want to actually uh, investigate this child. Now, there is a clinical staging that is there that's known as the Kramer staging. This Kramer staging is what was actually devised to see where the jaundice has reached clinically and can actually help you est establish how far or how, how high the bilirubin levels are. This is very useful for those people that are in the rural setups where you don't really have access to a lab that can do total serum bilirubin. But remember, this becomes very uh, inaccurate, especially if the child has started phototherapy. So the body is divided into zones, which like five zones, as you can see on the image on the right. And in a resource limited country like Zambia, where you have poor laboratory services in some parts of the country that may actually not be available in a timely manner, then clinical examination using the Kramer's rule can be used to make a diagnosis about whether you want to start phototherapy or you don't. So remember that this Kramer staging is a clinical assessment of jaundice. And it's uh, very unreliable, especially in those that are dark skinned, those that have started phototherapy. So the progression of jaundice, what you really need to know is that it starts off from the head going down to the toe. So from a cephalocodal direction. So the head would be usually the first the structures in the head would be first to be jaundiced, then it descends like that. So the Kramer's rule actually entails a visual inspection 
under natural light. So the body is divided into five zones, like I said. So zone one is if it's affecting the head and the neck. That means it's roughly around 100 micromoles or six milligrams per deciliter. If it's zone two, the upper chest, the upper body, which is predominantly the chest, it's roughly about 150 micromoles per liter. That's nine milligrams per deciliter. Zone three, which is affecting the lower body below the belly button and the upper thigh and the arms, that's roughly around 200 micromoles per liter. That's about 12 milligrams per deciliter. Zone four, which is the lower legs and the forearms, that's about 250 micromoles per liter. That's roughly about 15 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Then zone five, we're affecting even the hands and the feet. So if you check the, the baby and you see even the hands and the feet, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet are affected and they're jaundiced, know that these levels are greater than 250 micromoles per liter. Anyone who is at zone two and above, they need to start phototherapy. So remember that if you can assess the level of jaundice, uh, if you any jaundice that's from the chest, level two and below, it means you must start phototherapy. So remember that you may sometimes do a type of screening, which is known as a transcutaneous bilirubin screening. This is done similar to like the way you take temperature with um, an infrared gun, if you have used an inf infrared gun on um, the WAD. So this transcutaneous bilirubin screening can be done on selected infants who require this formal total serum bilirubin levels. So what happens is that uh, the the transcutaneous bilirubin screening decreases the number of heel pricks and the number of readmissions for phototherapy. So this monitor should not be relied on, especially in, in cases where you have this severe hyperbilirubinemia. So this should also not be done whenever a child has been having phototherapy in the past 24 hours or they have had an exchange transfusion. It won't be reliable. Local edema and even decreased uh, tissue perfusion can affect the accuracy of the transcutaneous uh, bilirubin measurements. And generally, how do we do this? So remember that you're going to ensure that all staffs are actually properly trained on how to use the transcutaneous bilirubin device. It's just a shame that I actually didn't add a picture of what it looks like on these slides. You can just simply Google what it looks like and have an idea. Then you calibrate the device daily in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. And after that, you're going to aim the, the device preferably in the interscapular region for the infants that are less than 35, but you can use the forehead, you can also use the sternum. So the measurements should not be made over any bruised skin or any areas that are covered by hair or any birthmarks, because this may affect the reading. And of course, the measurement is done by pressing the tip of the device over the examination site, then pressing the trigger button until the device indicates that the measure is complete. And remember, it takes about three to five measurements, depending on the device that you're using from the examination site to ensure that you have a consistent placement of the tip and the amount of pressure is uh, applied. And remember, if the transcutaneous bilirubin amount is within 20 micromoles of the phototherapy line, then you should do a total serum bilirubin level. What investigations are we going to do? So we want to evaluate the indirect hyperbilirubinemia because remember, most children that have conjugated bilirubinemia are going to have obstructive type of jaundice. So mostly you'd want to largely con the consult the uh, pediatric surgeons, but in terms of those that have unconjugated type, you're going to be treating these medically. So you want to get a full blood count. You want to get a reticulocyte count. You want to get a smear that may indicate hemolysis. You may see cystocytes, which are these uh, helmet cells or fragmented red blood cells that may indicate hemolysis. You want to also get evaluation for sepsis, a full blood count, C-reactive protein, urine cultures, stool cultures, blood cultures. You can do a, a hepatitis B surface antigen, RPR to check for syphilis. Then for those that have indirect uh, or rather direct hyperbilirubinemia or conjugated type of jaundice, you generally want to get an ultrasound to evaluate for any presence of a colidocal cyst. You also want to get serology for the viral hepatitis. You also want to get a radioisotope scan for the hepatobiliary tree. Of course, this is not present in most of our setup here in uh, our local facilities. Then you also want to evaluate for sepsis if it's indicated. Now, how do we treat these patients? Remember that the treatment is based on two things. It's based on the gestational age of the baby and the postnatal age of the baby. It's also dependent on the underlying cause. So it means that 
whenever you're beginning your statement, if someone asks you, how would you manage jaundice? You would say it's dependent on the gestational age of the baby. It's dependent on the postnatal age of the baby. It's also dependent on the cause. Remember that babies who are preterm should be treated at a lower threshold of the serum bilirubin as compared to the babies that are born at term because there's a higher risk of them developing connectors. So remember that several factors such as the well-being of the child, the severity of the hemolysis, the presence of sepsis must also be taken into consideration. And all these things, if present, they do lower the threshold such that you can intervene and you can treat this child. So the serum bilirubin assessments, observation and reassurance are appropriate for the physiological jaundice. Then phototherapy and exchange transfusion are the mainstay treatment for those that have unconjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia. Then you may also give them intravenous gamma globulins. Uh, that's the polygam that can be used in some cases. Remember that there is weak evidence that the IV immunoglobulins are going to be reducing the need of exchange transfusion clinically and it may be used in the following situations and should be discussed with the senior clinician before you actually give this. For example, for babies that have RH disease unmodified by antenatal treatment, for babies that have a potential ABO hemolytic disease of the newborn with uh, a previous sibling that had severe hemolytic disease of the newborn requiring an exchange transfusion, for babies that have signs of bilirubin encephalopathy, for if uh, there is a delay in obtaining the blood for exchange transfusion beyond four hours and or if the total serum bilirubin is continuing to rise greater than 8.5 micromoles per hour despite optimal uh, phototherapy and hydration you'd want to consider giving them intravenous gamma globulins and remember the dose is 0.5 grams per kg and is given over two hours now what about early onset jaundice within 24 hours how are we going to tackle this remember this is usually due to hemolytic disease of the newborn most likely an ABO and or a recess incompatibility. So you want to check the mother's blood group. If the mother has an O blood group, then ABO is likely to do the following things. So you want to do an infant's blood group and a Coombs test. You also want to get an FBC and a peripheral smear on the infant. And you also want to check the total serum bilirubin every three hours. Then you also want to start these patients on phototherapy. Remember that in rare cases, you want to look for other causes of hemolysis. Now, if it's jaundice that is occurring after 24 hours, remember you want to exclude blood incompatibility. You want to exclude any obvious uh, infections or any extravasated blood or bruising, which may be due to cephalohematomas or caput saxodanium. You may want to check if the infant is feeding, check the infant's weight to exclude breastfeeding jaundice. You want to exclude polycythemia, so you want to do a full blood count on this infant. And often a cause will not be found in the term infants. And in term infants is actually thought to be an exaggerated form of physiological hyperbilirubinemia. In preterm infants, of course, it's due to immaturity of the conjugation mechanisms. The treatment must depend on the levels of the total serum bilirubin, which should be checked daily. There is a phototherapy chart that I added to this lecture that I will show you how exactly we use the phototherapy chart. So this is the phototherapy machine and this is how it looks like. This may actually show up on your OSCE exams and you may be asked how it works, which advance would you actually put on it, how are you going to do it, and when are you going to stop, what side effects do you anticipate. So remember that phototherapy uses blue light, which is the most effective with a wavelength of about 430 to 490 nanometers. And it's very effective because it's going to be acting by photoisomerization, where it creates these water-soluble photoisomers of indirect bilirubin. It does this by polar configurational isomers, the ZE enantiomers. It may also do this by structural isomerization, where it converts it to a chemical that's known as lumirubin, which is slightly much more water-soluble than the unconjugated bilirubin. It also works through photooxidation. Remember that the intense uh, the intensive phototherapy is going to be delivered at a spectral irradiance of about 30 or higher to the greatest exposed uh, body surface area. Now, what are some of the indications? And this is the phototherapy chart. I'll come very shortly to it. Remember that this is going to be indicated for babies that have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia of a crammer of two or greater, or those that are meeting the phototherapy threshold according to the guidelines. So how exactly now would we use this chart? So suppose you get a child that is weighing, let's say, 3.2 kg. Um, and the, you do their serum bilirubin levels and you find out that their serum bilirubin levels are at 250. So, and they are six hours, they are actually, let me just say, they are 28 uh, hours of 
life. So 28 hours of life would be somewhere in between 24 and 36 here. And remember that this chart is weighing 3.2 kg. So it means that as you can see here, these lines indicate the different weights. So you can use either the gestational age when they were born, but the age is much better for you to use. So you want to come and see, okay, this child is above 3 kg. So they were born at 38 weeks. So you want to use this line here with the circles. There are 28 days of life. There are 28 days of life. You follow this here and you see that the, you come and see where 250 is. You can see that 250 is somewhere here and they've already exceeded the threshold. They have crossed this line. As long as a child has crossed this line, it means that you need to start phototherapy. And when you start the phototherapy, you want to check the TSB every 12 to 24 hours. And if the TSB is greater than 30 micromoles above uh, the line, you want to check the TSB uh, four to six hourly. Then when do you actually stop doing the phototherapy is if now you have checked the TSB and you see that the TSB level has fallen below 50 uh, micromoles per liter below this line. So you don't just stop because the child is looking better. You actually measure the level of the TSB and it should be less than 50 uh, micromoles per liter below the threshold, then you can actually stop the phototherapy. Remember that a lower threshold is going to be used to start phototherapy in the high-risk infants, those that have sepsis, those that have hypoxic encephalopathy. What are some of the contraindications? Remember, if someone has a congenital porphyria or a history of family history of porphyria, you don't want to get them under phototherapy. If there's a concurrent therapy with the, the uh, metalloporphyrin heme oxygenase inhibitors, if there's concurrent use of drugs or agents that are photosensitizers, and you don't want to do phototherapy for those drugs. So what is the technique and how do we care for a child that is on phototherapy? So remember that the position of the machine is approximately 40 centimeters from the infant. It's going to be, you measure the irradiance uh, of the phototherapy units periodically using a photoradiometer. Of course, this is not routinely done in our system, but the biomed people are actually supposed to come and measure this daily. Then the phototherapy units actually um, require adequate ventilation, so do not put them over a blanket. They may actually catch fire. They may get damaged easily. Then during the phototherapy, ensure that you cover the infant's eyes because imagine you're staring into the sun. It damages your eyes and it's very irritating to the eyes. So you should cover the eyes with a, a gauze pad and you place the infant that's naked the, with a nappy untied. Of course, if it's a male infant, you want to cover the gonads. Then you want to remove the iPads during feeding to check if there's any conjunctivitis. And of course, cover the genitalia in the males. You want to turn the infant every two to three hours. And generally in severely jaundiced uh, children, you want to check the TSB. You can even do it three hourly. Then you want to monitor the temperature because they may have hyperthermia or temperature instability. You may also want to ensure that there's adequate fluid intake because there's a risk of dehydration. You should have some visual assessment of the jaundice, but this is unreliable once a child starts phototherapy. That's why I'm stressing on you getting the TSP levels. And remember that for successful phototherapy, you should produce a decline in the TSP of 17 to 34 micromoles within four to six hours, and the TSP should continue to fall. And you're going to stop the phototherapy if the TSP is greater than 50 micromoles below the phototherapy line. So what are some of the complications of phototherapy? These are going to include rashes, which may be due to photodermatitis. You may have bronzing, especially if someone has a conjugated bilirubin and you actually put them under phototherapy, their skin will turn bronze, a bronze baby type of um, skin. You may have temperature instability, either hypothermia or hyperthermia. You may have loose stools or diarrhea. You may have separation from the mother because the child is under this machine for prolonged periods of time. Then... Of course, you also may have the damage to the eyes, damage to the gonads if they're not protected. Then another modality that we use, but not commonly in our setup here, is the exchange transfusion. I've only noted that this is actually done at UTH. Uh, at other facilities, I haven't seen it being done. So remember that the exchange transfusion is going to be performed for those that have rapidly rising levels of bilirubin that is secondary to hemolytic disease. And generally, the aim is to remove the antibody-coated red blood cells and the antibodies in the serum and to reduce and correct the anemia. So the estimated blood volume of a neonate is about 85 mils per kg, while for the preterm neonate is about 100 mils per kg. Adequate hydration is important because dehydration will increase the serum bilirubin levels. 
And remember, often by the time the blood is available for the procedure, the phototherapy would have actually reduced the TSP below the threshold for the exchange values. So remember, do not proceed if the exchange is no longer indicated. Return the blood back to the blood back to the blood bank and store it in the refrigerator for someone else who may need it. Remember, two types of exchange transfusion methods can be used. We have what is known as the isovolumetric method, and we have what is known as the push-pull method. I'm not going to go into details of these methods. If you want to find out details of this method, you can actually do some further reading online with reputable sources. But generally, the iso, iso volumetric method and the pull-push method, these are the materials that are used, and it's just to hint at you of what is actually used in these different procedures, but you must actually read up on these procedures online, watch a few videos of how it's actually done. This video is not meant to look at the exchange transfusions. And again, you also have a similar chart and the way that chart also works is quite similar to the one that we did for phototherapy. So I'm not going to spend so much time explaining this. Remember that indications include severe unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, any infant with clinical signs of acute bilirubin encephalopathy. If you have an infant with severe anemia complicated by cardiac failure who need a blood transfusion, you should consider an exchange transfusion. Now, what are some of the complications of an exchange transfusion? You may have metabolic complications like hypocalcemia, hypo and hyperglycemia, hyperkalemia, you may have cardiorespiratory complications like apnea, bradycardia, hypo and hypertension. You may have hematological complications like thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. You may have catheter-related complications like vasospasms, thromb thrombosis. You may have embolization. You may have GIT-related complications like feeding intolerance, necrotizing enterocolitis. And of course, you may also have infections as complications. And complications that are arising as of the jaundice include things like connectorus, which is bilirubin encephalopathy. This is the main complication. So remember that this is going to be occurring as deposits of this bilirubin and damage to the basal ganglia and to the auditory nucleus, but it can also affect any part of the brain. So generally, the indirect bilirubin at sufficiently high concentrations can pass through the blood-brain barrier and can produce this irreversible damage. The bilirubin most frequently localizes in the basal ganglia, it can localize in the hippocampus and sometimes in some brainstem nuclei. And this is going to be occurring when the levels of bilirubin are exceeding the amount of albumin that can bind to this bilirubin in the blood. So clinical features are going to be including things like lethargy, poor feeding, which is an acute manifestation. In severe cases, there may be irritability, increased muscle tone, which may cause the baby to lie in an arched position, kind of like as if they are demon possessed. So we call this as opisthotonus. Then you may have choreoathetoid cerebral palsy, which is due to damage of the basal ganglia. You may have hearing loss, which is a sensory neurotype of deafness. You may have opistotinus, which I already talked about. You may sometimes have seizures in these children, and you may have ocular motor paralysis. Here is a summary to summarize the causes of jaundice in the neonatal period. You may pause the video, take a screenshot of whatever is depicted on your screen. It may help you remember. And of course, here's a summary of everything I've talked about in terms of the history and questions that you would ask on the history, examination, the management of the child, and certain investigations that you would actually order for. Now, what about a child that has prolonged neonatal jaundice? Remember the jaundice lasting more than 14 days in a term infant or more than 28 days in a preterm infant is defined as prolonged neonatal jaundice. We want to determine whether it is unconjugated or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So generally, with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, you want to determine whether or not the baby is breastfeeding. You also want to collect urine for MC, MCS. You also want to collect urine for reducing substances to exclude galactosemia. You want to check for the liver enzymes. You want to exclude any hypothyroidism. You want to exclude any hemolysis and you want to check the reticular sites and the HB. You want to exclude any hereditary enzyme defects like Gilbert syndrome and even kriglan najjar syndrome, which are rare. And in terms of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, you generally want to get a history and physical examination. You want to do your liver function test and your cholesterol. You want to examine the stool daily. Remember, a colic or white type of stool requires an urgent referral to exclude biliary atresia that may need some surgical repair. And you also want to exclude infective causes. You also want to exclude any metabolic causes and exclude some genetic conditions. Remember, here's a table that of the different causes of hyperbilirubinemia and the different tests that you may actually uh, 
do or the causative agents. So the viruses, the bacteria, protozoa, metabolic drugs, autoimmune, you may pause the video. I've already talked about and alluded to most of these that are depicted on your screen. Then here's a diagnostic workup for the patients that have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Just pause the screen, uh, take a screenshot of this. It may be helpful for you in the clinical practice. I really hope you enjoyed this video on neonatal jaundice. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.